7.55 last Friday morning, Julie Pat says she took her son downstairs. She came back up and watched from this fire escape as he passed down West Broadway toward the bus stop where a group of other children and parents were waiting. She never dreamed he didn't get on that bus, not until 4 o'clock in the afternoon when he failed to return home. I just want whoever you are to bring him home. I still gag with the fear that this child must have felt. <laughs> Welcome to the first episode of our mini-series, Not in Vain, where we focus on cases that led to changes in legislation or protocol and improve the way investigations are carried out in murder, missing persons and sexual assault cases. Today's episode is about Aton Pates, a six-year-old boy who went missing in 1979. Aton's abduction became the catalyst for change in the search for missing children and prompted the creation of National Missing Children's Day and the Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. 41 years on, each presidential administration in the US has kept the reminder of Aton and National Missing Children's Day on the anniversary of his disappearance, May 25th. This homage to Aton became an international commemoration in 2001, with International Missing Children's Day occurring globally. On Friday, May 25th, 1979, Aton Pates woke up and dressed himself in blue pants, a blue jacket, blue sneakers and his prized possession his Black Eastern Airlines future flight captain hat. His mid-length blonde hair peeked out from beneath the cap as he promised his mother Julie, quote, It's fine, Mum. I can do it, unquote. Just before 8am, Julie Pates walked her son down three flights of stairs, kissed him goodbye, and watched from the entrance to their apartment block in Soho as he made the short two-block journey to the bus stop near West Broadway. Julie went back up to the apartment where she was busy taking care of her two-year-old son and another toddler. Stanley, Aiton's father, was a photographer getting ready for work and their older daughter Shira attended a different school than her little brother. Julie ran a daycare from their apartment on Prince Street where the family had lived for eight years. When Aiton didn't come home that afternoon, Julie began looking for him in the neighbourhood that felt so safe just a few hours earlier. She rang the mother of one of Aitan's closest friends. It was then that she learned that Aitan had never gone to school. He never even made it on the bus. A search for the six-year-old was launched with close to 100 police officers and a pack of bloodhounds canvassing the lower Manhattan area. The apartment that was once a busy daycare centre then became the headquarters in the search for Aitan. The last time anyone saw Aitan was around 8am on the corner of Prince and Worcester Street. He was carrying a tote bag imprinted with an elephant design and walking in the direction of the bus stop. After that, there was no trace of the little boy. Three days later, Julie said, I hope he's with somebody wiser than he, who will take care of him and is still taking care of him. And if he is, I don't want to hurt you in any way. I don't want to prosecute. I just want whoever you are to bring him home. The Soho community and the majority of New Yorkers were out in force trying to find Aton and bring him home, but the family became, quote, pariahs, unquote. Within a month, the police search teams went from 500 officers strong to just four detectives from the missing persons squad. In a June 1979 interview with the New York Times, Julie said, quote, The community has been very supportive, and people have been wonderful in the search for Aton and distributing more than 300,000 circulars but I can understand why they personally want to shun us. They're self-conscious, and I suppose parents worry that there's some weirdo out there and what happened to Aitan could happen to their kids. We know he's alive. Whoever took him might be desperate for a child, but that person can't make Aitan happy. We won't press charges. All we ask is, please bring Aitan back to us. Unquote. The paid settled on to hope that Aitan would come home. For almost four decades, they never moved from the apartment in case their boy made his way back to them. They never changed their phone number because Aton knew it off by heart. No, for the longest time, we didn't know, we didn't know what had happened to him. We didn't know where he, he might be. So of course, the the thought in the backs of our minds was always that we should be here for him. Stanley Pates was a commercial photographer. He had numerous photographs of Aton that were distributed throughout New York 
emblazoned on missing persons posters to try and prompt someone to come forward. From the day of Aitan's disappearance, the family were hounded by the media. As written in the book After Aitan by Lisa R. Cohen, released in 2009, the lack of empathy for the family was clear. The book details an interaction between a tabloid photographer and Julie Pates. Quote, Would you mind working up a few tears for me now? The man asked Julie. So I don't have to come back and bother you again when they find the body? The photographer never had to come back. Aitan's body has never been found. Unquote. Years passed and the Pates family had to try and regain some semblance of normality for their children at home, Shira and Ari. There were no answers to the questions of when. When should they move forward? When would they give up? And as their youngest son asked them, when can we smile again? At the time, there were very few standards in conducting an investigation into a missing child. Stanley said to the press, quote, Our children are our most precious possession, but any business has tighter inventory control than almost any school, unquote. In the late 70s and early 80s, it was harder to communicate information across state lines and throughout districts. Aitan Pates was one of the first children to feature on a milk carton. His disappearance paved the way for new ways for tracking missing children. It did not ease his parents' pain. Stanley Pates had hoped for years that someone was taking care of Aitan. He said, quote, In our minds, there were only two possibilities. Either Aitan was taken by a stranger and killed, or he was taken by a very sad woman desperate for a child of her own, and we hoped that such a woman would at least take care of him and keep him safe. Unquote. There were a number of theories as to what happened and who took Aitan, but investigations proved fruitless. The first suspect was Othniel Miller. Miller had been the one who gave Aitan the one dollar bill he carried to school. He gave it to him the day before. Miller owned a workshop that was on the route Aitan would have taken to the bus stop the day he vanished in 1979. Not long after Aitan went missing, the workshop floor was redone. Fresh concrete was poured over and at the time, investigators decided it would be too expensive to dig it up. In 2012, after Miller's ex-wife told police that he had raped a 10-year-old girl decades earlier, police went and excavated the workshop. Nothing was found. The second suspect was Jose Ramos. Ramos had been the main suspect from the early stages in the investigation. Ramos had a connection to Aitan through his then-girlfriend. She had been hired to walk Aitan to the bus stop sometimes. So that was the first time there was a real connection between a horrible person and our family. Ramos was a drifter. He had been accused of inappropriate behaviour towards children before, and in 1987 he was convicted of corruption of a minor and indecent assault on a five-year-old child. Ramos gave a partial confession to a federal prosecutor about attempting to molest Aton, but denied that he had killed him. Ramos was never criminally convicted of anything relating to Aton Pates. With his other victims, Ramos had tried to build up their trust and was often seen with children. No one ever saw him with Aton Pates before. Every year, Stanley Pates would send Ramos a letter to try and get him to confess to hurting Aton. Here he is talking about it on Nightline in 2009. I send him the, uh, the, the missing poster. I type one line on the back and same line every, every year. What did you do to my little boy? Pate's family weren't sure what had happened to Aitan, but they knew that whatever happened must have been terrifying for the six-year-old. At some point he must have realized that things were going bad. And I still, I still gag with the fear that this child must have felt. <laughs> Aitan was legally declared dead in 2001. Despite no trace of his body or any convictions, a wrongful death lawsuit filed by the Pates family granted judgement against Ramos, ruling that he was responsible for Aitan's death. That all changed again a few weeks after Miller's workshop floor was excavated. Although nothing was found there, someone did reach out to investigators shortly after. Jose Lopez from New Jersey said that he believed his brother-in-law, Pedro Hernandez, was responsible for Aitan's death. Pedro Hernandez had been working in a bodega along Aitan's route to the bus stop on May 25th, 1979. Soon after the six-year-old disappeared, Hernandez moved back to New Jersey, where he lived until his arrest in 2012. You would think that, given no one had mentioned Pedro Hernandez before, that he must have kept it a secret for over 30 years, 
but he didn't. He had told numerous people about it, people from his church, his ex-wife, a childhood friend, among others. After his brother-in-law alerted the authorities, Hernandez was interviewed. After hours of being interviewed, he confessed. He said that he had lured Eitan into the basement of the bodega on the promise of a cold soda. Once inside, he attacked Eitan from behind, choking him and then putting him into a plastic bag. Here is a clip of him recounting his confession to a psychiatrist in 2014. I think I was working there for a year, something like that, I'm not sure, a year, two years. And you would, and John Pates never came into the store? I never seen him. You, ne you never saw him in the store, or you never saw him, never period? I never seen him in the store, I never seen him before. You had never seen him before? Never. Mm -hmm. When you did see him, how long was he standing there before you, uh, before you approached him? Five minutes. Um, were you watching him? Or were you going up and down the stairs? And what were you doing during these five minutes? I went to the store, put the, the sodas in the store, mm -hmm. come back up, and I stand in front of the store, and there he was, in the mm -hmm. front of the store. Mm -hmm. Then I approached him and I asked him if he wanted something to drink. He didn't answer me. He nodded his head. I went down to the basement, he followed me to the basement. And whatever happened there, I choked him. It was something that just happened like quick. I don't know why I did it. I don't know why it happened. I don't even know if it happened. Mm -hmm. I never saw his face. Then he went in front of me. I stood beha behind him. And I choked him. Then when I choked him, I started shaking. And uh, there was a plastic bag and a box. Where did it came from? I do not know. It was thick. So I put him inside the bag. Then I tied the bag with the same bag. I put him inside the box. It was like a banana box, something, I don't remember. What kind of box was it? It was a cardboard box. I put him up on my shoulder. I cut him out of the store, out to like a block away, a block and a half, away from the store. There was people following me from the basement, all the people that were there at the same time when he was there. They followed me out. I took him, I put him like a block and a half away. I set him up on the basement, up in the hallway. And I walked back to the store. And I started working just like nothing. Who took it? I don't know. Anything happened to it? I don't know. I have no idea. Somebody must have took it. Somebody must have known something. Anybody answer? I don't know. I have no idea. That was the truth. I don't know nothing. And I went back to work, and then later on that day, um, I heard the news that there was a shower missing. Mm -hmm. uh, they showed his picture on the on the TV, mm -hmm. but I didn't say anything because I didn't feel like I had to say anything. So I didn't feel like do I do anything wrong. The next day I went Tell back. Tell me about that. Like, I got ready at 10 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. to see if the box was there, but it was not there. Mm. It was gone. Mm. Somebody must have removed it from there. I don't know if they put it in the garbage. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know if, I don't know if he left. I don't know if he's still alive. Mm. He might be alive mm -hmm. because he was still alive mm -hmm. in the box. He was moving in the box. What did you feel? I feel his movement in the box when I was cutting him. Mm -hmm. He must have been still alive. He probably is alive somewhere. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I don't know. 
He said that he thought the boy was still alive when he placed him into a plastic bag inside a box that he dumped a block away. 33 years to the day after Eitan disappeared, the police announced that they had arrested the person they believed to be responsible. This evening, the New York City Police Department is announcing the arrest of Pedro Hernandez, age 51, of Maple Shade, New Jersey, for the murder of Eitan Pates. Hernandez confessed to choking Eitan 33 years ago tomorrow in the basement of a bodega located at 448 West Broadway in Manhattan. Earlier this month, the NYPD Missing Person Squad received information from an individual, which led them to identify Hernandez as a person of interest in Eton's disappearance on May 25, 1979. In the years following Eton's disappearance, Hernandez had told a family member and others that he had, quote, done a bad thing and killed a child in New York. Last night, after being questioned, Hernandez returned voluntarily from New Jersey with detectives to Manhattan. He brought them to the scene of the crime, which is now a store that sells eyeglasses. Hernandez described to the detectives how he lured young Eton from the school bus stop at West Broadway and Prince Street with the promise of a soda. He then led him into the basement of the bodega, choked him there, and disposed of the body by putting it into a plastic bag and placing it into the trash. He had worked as a stock clerk in the bodega for approximately one month. At the time of Eton's disappearance, Hernandez resided in a nearby apartment on West Broadway. We have informed the Pates family of these developments. We're working closely with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office on this investigation. And we can only hope that these developments bring some measure of peace to the family. Hernandez was brought to trial in 2015, but that resulted in a mistrial after 18 days of deliberations. He was retried in February 2017 and after nine days of deliberations, was found guilty of kidnapping in the first degree and murder in the second degree. Pedro Hernandez's defence team focused on his own lack of credibility, stating that, quote, Pedro Hernandez is the only witness against himself. The stories he told over the years, including in 2012 and since, are the only evidence, unquote. There was no forensic evidence presented at the trial and Hernandez was said to have been mentally ill, intellectually disabled and suffered from hallucinations. During the trial, Julie spoke about how just the day before Aitan went missing, she had been watching him play outside in his bike, but after going inside to check on the children in the daycare, she noticed he wasn't where she had last seen him. Frantic with fear, she raced outside, looked around corners and up and down the street and couldn't find him, until he came pedalling back to her. The neighbourhood felt safe. All of Aitan's friends were allowed to walk to the bus stop. His best friend Chelsea testified that she had saved him a seat on the bus, but he never got on. Once the sentence had been passed, Aitan's father Stanley said, quote, After all these years, we finally know the dark secret you had locked in your heart. You threw him in the garbage. You are the monster in your nightmares. The god you pray to will never forgive you. Now I know what the face of evil looks like. Unquote. The Pates family will never get their son back, or all the years they spent waiting to know what happened to him. The case affected many things, from the awareness of parents and the public to the dangers facing children, and it awakened a global awareness of missing children. National and International Missing Children's Day occurs on the anniversary of Aitan's disappearance each year. The day aims to commemorate those still lost with forget-me-not flowers, and to spread the message of a unified response to protect vulnerable children. The Pates has advocated for change and helped to create a national missing children's hotline. This made it easier for law enforcement agencies to exchange information and cases and help bring missing children home. For decades, Aitan's parents never moved house or changed their number despite the constant harassment from the media. 
They wanted to be there for Eitan in case he ever came home. And once they knew what had happened, they were finally able to move forward and out of the neighbourhood that never felt the same after Eitan. Thank you for listening to this episode. Every month we'll be releasing a new episode from the Not In Vain series and if you have any case suggestions, please let us know. You can email them to us or you can get us on social media at Crime Labs Pod and at Crime Labs Podcast. You can get these episodes one month early by joining as a $5 Hourglass patron.